Good day, and welcome to the Plant Engineering Webcast, Reduce Unplanned Downtime and Endorse Predictive Maintenance, sponsored by Leviton Manufacturing. I'm your moderator, Kevin Parker, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Plant Engineering. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with the slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or on the webcast platform. For technical problems with this audio or slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of the screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask Question box, and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. You can also type questions for our speaker in the Ask a Question box. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion, a PDF copy of the presentation, and other resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. These documents will also be available with the on-demand version. Now we will hear from the sponsor of today's webcast, Leviton Manufacturing. At the conclusion of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. Welcome back. I'd now like to introduce today's presenter, John Garbarino. John is Senior Platform Product Manager, Commercial and Industrial with Leviton Manufacturing. For the past 12 years, John has worked with the product development teams for Leviton's commercial and industrial product portfolio. John has held management roles in marketing and more recently is leading the development efforts of Leviton's Inform Intelligent Platform, a technology platform that enables Leviton products to provide real-time operational data used to improve safety, efficiency, and productivity in commercial and industrial environments. Without any further interruption, John, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Kevin. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you to all who are joining us today. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. So the flow of today's presentation will be as follows. We're going to start off talking about the hidden costs of unplanned downtime, followed by a description and discussion on the types of maintenance programs that people are currently using in industry. Then after that, we'll use that information to talk about how do you come up with a strategic way of implementing a, a proper maintenance plan, and then talk to some of the technology solutions that are enabling uh, some of this, uh, these new methods for maintenance. So when we talk about you know, downtime, it's a, a big topic for, for most industries, manufacturing, of course, and, and, but other industries as well. And downtime tends to fall into two different buckets, planned and unplanned. Um, the definitions are, are self-explanatory, and, and obviously the goal is to reduce all types of downtime. 
But we're going to spend our time today really focusing on unplanned downtime events. And you know, as a matter of fact, um, the reason we do that is it is the most disruptive and costly uh, type of downtime that you can encounter. Recent surveys have shown that up to you know, uh, unplanned events can cost as much as 10 times more than planned events when you're talking about maintenance activities. And we also found out that most organizations don't truly uh, understand the true cost of their downtime. So let's talk a little bit about the cost of unplanned downtime. You know, when you start talking to people, they usually talk about the most obvious expenses associated with an unplanned event. And uh, that's typically the, the cost of the repair parts and the direct labor involved with uh, performing the repair. And obviously that's you know, a big chunk of, of what you're concerned with. Um, and, but the problem is a lot of companies will stop pretty close to there when they figure out, trying to figure out what an unplanned event actually costs the company. The fact is, there are a lot of other costs associated when you have an unplanned downtime event. So let's start to talk about a few of them. One of the things that you really have to consider is when you have an unplanned event, um, clearly if a machine goes down, the operator can't do their job. And so you really need to factor in you know, how much time is spent for the, uh, by the operators standing around waiting for the repair to happen. Now, some companies will say, well, you know, the machine only has one person attached to it, and if I get up and running quickly, I'm not really overly concerned with that cost. Um, but in fact, um, that's really the, ca the case, that only one person is affected for a short period of time. Think about your production line. If the production line goes down, you could easily have 5, 10, 20, 50 people that now have to stand around waiting for the repair to happen. Um, that starts to become significant. Uh, you know, especially as you start going into hours or perhaps even days, uh, which is you know, a terrible situation all the way around. Um, but it's really important, and I think a, a number of companies do consider the idle time, but I've actually spoken with some companies that never really consider that as part of their calculation of what, what an unplanned event costs them. Some of the other things that happen are the type of labor you use to, to respond to an unplanned event. Um, it becomes very expensive. Um, instead of having you know, just your scheduled maintenance mechanic working on the equipment, you may have to bring in outside labor. You may have to bring in labor from other areas to jump on the problem and get it done quick, more quickly. Uh, there's usually supervision and, and management involved to make sure all hands are on deck getting this uh, machine up and running again because you're impacting production. Um, so you have to you know, consider all of that what happens during an unplanned event. Uh, the ancillary resources that come in and, and calculate those costs as well. Another area that's often overlooked is, is the potential scrap during an unplanned event. And that can come from a number of reasons. Sometimes you know, there's an, a normal amount of scrap for restarting a production line that you have to deal with. Um, but a bigger chunk of that is what if you're in an industry that uh, actually has you know, a, a batch that goes bad because of the downtime events. You know, there's a spoilage factor in a, in a lot of industries. For example, in the pharmaceutical industry, um, one company cited that a typical batch during their process uh, represents about $500,000 worth of revenue. And if uh, the equipment goes down for an extended period, they lose that batch. Uh, I'm sure you have similar things if you're in the food and beverage industry and, and other areas where, you know, um, where lost time in the middle of a process creates a problem for whatever you're producing. So it's really significant in some industries. Uh, you really don't want to overlook that. Then there's some other uh, types of expenses that are sometimes hard to put a number on, but really can't be ignored. Things such as uh, you know, the lost production. When you're down, you're not producing. You may not have the ability to make that back, um, especially if you're, you're running three shifts, the equipment's running continuously. To, you lose production time, you've, you've lost that production. Lost capacity, lost revenue associated with, with all of that. Excess inventory, again, another area where some people don't really uh, consider what happens uh, if uh, 
production goes down. And it might sound a little bit odd saying, well, if my production is, line is down, I'm not producing, how do I wind up with an excess inventory? Well, there's a couple of ways that might happen. One, let's say uh, that uh, production line went down and now you were building an order and the customer cancels it because you missed the delivery deadline. You've now put inventory on the shelf that you weren't, you know, that you were planning on shipping and now it's got to be put on your shelf and stored. Um, there are other companies who actually use uh, building up excess inventory as a mitigation strategy against uh, production line downtime. Uh, so they decide, I don't want my customers to be impacted uh, by a downtime event, so I'm going to put extra inventory on the shelf so that if I have that problem, my customers aren't impacted. Um, but you have, you're, that costs you to put stuff on the shelf. And um, it sounds odd, but I've talked to companies who actually use that as a mitigation strategy. So um, if that's your strategy, you need to calculate that as part of your downtime. Things like non-performance penalties. You know, if you're producing parts in a JIT environment, you know, the person you're shipping to, if you miss their deadlines, you may have imposed penalties. Similarly, if you're, you're selling your product through distribution, your distributors will usually penalize you for uh, your poor fill rate and, and um, you know, missing deadlines, shipping deadlines. Those costs all have to be factored in to your downtime event because they're real. And of course, lost customers is sometimes a hard thing to put a number on, but uh, you, know, you have enough of these events, uh, especially if you're in an industry where customers have more than one choice for a product. Um, if you can't deliver, your competitor can, and it's very easy to lose a customer. So downtime has some real significant impacts that you really need to think about. There's one other thing too that's hard to put an economic number on, but it's more of a, you know, a, a human cost than, a, than an economic cost, although there could be both. And that's with regard to employee safety. So if you think about it, when you have an unscheduled event, production's down, all hands on deck to get it um, back up online, it's not uncommon for the maintenance personnel to maybe take some shortcuts, especially in, in, with regard to your safety protocols, to get things up and running uh, fast. That can put you in a precarious situation. There was one study that showed that up to 30% of all deaths in manufacturing occurred during some sort of maintenance activity. Yeah, that's pretty startling. And uh, not to say that all of it was because of an unplanned event, but clearly the more maintenance events you have, and the more risky types of events you have, uh, the more workers wind up being at risk. So that's something you really need to think about uh, when you're talking about uh, downtime. And then there's you know, a whole host of other things. This is not an all-inclusive list, um, but you know, we've spoken about this as if a particular production line or piece of equipment is in a silo, but the fact is you could have a machine goes down, goes down on one line, but it impacts a number of lines within the facility it becomes a bottleneck area. Uh, you're maybe not filling the next production line waiting for the sub-assemblies that are being built on one, or you've got product backing up waiting to get processed in, in that line. So um, all of that has a cost associated with it. And uh, so it's really imperative uh, that you think about that. And it's really important because as you'll see later when we discuss it, it's one of the factors you really need to consider when you're trying to determine what's the best maintenance plan for my facility. If you don't have an accurate understanding of, of your, uh, all the costs associated with when a piece of equipment goes down, um, you're going to maybe make the wrong choice when it comes to maintenance. So just a few more statistics. Um, there's been a number of uh, companies that have done surveys and, and studies in this space over the last few years to try and really get a handle on, on what's going on in terms of maintenance and what people are trying to do to mitigate problems. And so there was one study that looked at a whole bunch of companies across a broad array, array of industries and actually across the globe, not just in one location. And what they found out is that 80% of the companies acknowledge they're really unable to calculate the true cost of downtime correctly. And a lot of it is because they didn't really think of some of the more indirect costs or the things that don't seem to be directly involved, but, but in fact are. Similarly, the same group of companies acknowledged that um, they didn't really that they actually had at least one unplanned downtime event in the three-year period preceding the survey. Um, the average was closer to three, 
but uh, you know, they all acknowledge they have unplanned events that they have to deal with regardless of what maintenance, what programs they had in place. And that the cost of downtime they calculated was in the neighborhood of $260,000 an hour on average. Now that might sound like a lot, and this is another thing that will vary depending on what kind of industry you're in. So, you know, there was a lot of manufacturing companies where they say my typical cost of dial time is somewhere between the $22 to $50,000 per hour range, you know, far less significant than the $260,000 an hour. But if you look at the automotive industry, um, they will cite that it's uh, closer to $50,000 per minute uh, to, for downtime. That's $3 million an hour. So that's way more significant than if you're thinking uh, maybe it's only $15,000 an hour. Um, not trivial by any means, uh, but there's a wide variance and it's going to depend on what industry you're in. Oil and gas, the costs are even higher. And I'm sure you've done similar studies in your own industries and have a better handle on, on what that would be. The other thing that came out of the study is that the average downtime event lasted about four hours. And so if you start multiplying that four hours times you know, $3 million in the auto industry, you can see how quickly those costs add up. And that comes right out of the bottom line. You don't get that back. And then in the same study, about 70% of the companies said they're really not fully aware of when the equipment is really due for maintenance repair, upgrade, or replacement. And it's really because their systems weren't necessarily designed to capture all of that. Now here's one interesting uh, statistic we'd like to focus on. Um, in, in a study done by the ARC uh, advisory group, um, one of the things they determined is that, that when there is an unplanned event, and it's a traditional way of going about things to repair it. In the average of repair, 76% of the time that the machine is down is spent on just trying to diagnose and troubleshoot the problem. And only 24% is spent actually fixing the problem. So if you use that previous example of an average of four hours of downtime, that means three hours of the four hours that the machine was down was just spending, spent trying to figure out what happened and what are we going to do about it. And then an hour performing the repair. You can start to see that's an area where you'd really want to focus on, and how do I tackle that? You know, that seems a bit outrageous that um, the bulk of that time is actually spent just trying to figure out what to do as opposed to actually performing the repair. And of course, that's assuming that you have all the parts and, and skills needed to perform the repair at the, at the moment this happens. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of maintenance programs that people employ in industry. And those types of maintenance programs we'll discuss are reactive, preventive, predictive, and prescriptive. So before we move on, we're ready for our first poll question. What we'd like to know is what type of maintenance program is being used in your facility today? Are you using reactive, preventive, predictive, prescriptive? Do you not have a program or you're just unsure? If, you, if you're unsure, just put in no formal program. And if you use more than one, just pick the one that's most uh, preferential. All right, we got some results coming in now. So not surprising, uh, preventive seems to be very popular. At least half of, half of the uh, survey respondents are saying they have some sort of preventive measure. What is a little bit surprising is that uh, a lot of people say they have no formal program at all. And we'll have some conversation around why that's not really a good idea. It looks like we're tapering off. Uh, this is some really good insights. All 
All right, so if we're taking a quick look at the results, it looks like um, about 13% of you say you have a reactive program, 44% have a preventive program. Nice to see uh, people moving into the predictive range. And then no formal program, 21%. That's a little bit surprising. But. Okay. So let's t just talk a little bit about the different types of programs and the pros and cons of, of all of them. So reactive is, is kind of what it sounds like. I, you know, I don't do anything until a machine actually breaks down. It's the old, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach to things. And um, you know, it's, it's sort of an attractive method if, uh, if you're looking at it from a, a standpoint of, of trying to plan something. Um, you know, there's no investment cost to implement this type of program. There's no specialized training to monitor things. Um, there's no upfront investment in, in kind of software or hardware to manage it. Um, but the big problem is it only leads to unplanned downtime. And as we just started this discussion, you know, unplanned downtime is really the worst possible situation in terms of cost and disruption. So anytime you can do anything to minimize unplanned events, you should be doing so. And with a, a strictly reactive plan, you don't have an opportunity to really do that. You know, some of the other things you think about um, because of that, since you never know when things are going to happen, how do you, you know, have the right parts in place to deal with a problem when it happens? It becomes very difficult to you know, control your budgets because you don't know what your expenses are going to be. You don't know if you're going to have the right maintenance people on staff at the time the repair needs to happen. And that leads into you know the expensive labor type thing we we spoke about earlier. Um, tends to be you know, more time consuming. As we looked at, there's a lot of time spent trying to figure out what's going on and how to deal with it. The other thing that can happen in, in this type of event is we, we mentioned that you know people will tend to rush things to get um, production back up and running quickly. You know that sometimes leads to to shortcuts, which means that the repair may not last as long as it should have. Um, so now you're doing another event sooner than you should have to because it wasn't fixed right the first time. Or maybe the inspection uh, wasn't really done thoroughly, and so there were other parts that should have been handled at the same time that were not, and now you're into another down, uh, unscheduled event shortly thereafter. And then, of course, when you know, it usually leads to machines not really running well because of uh, you know, a machine fails. Usually it isn't necessarily a single component that's the problem. You may only replace a single component, but you're putting stress on related components, and that shortens the lifespan of, of the equipment. Um, so what happens is reduced equipment asset life, um, higher energy costs. You know, when you, your machines aren't running at 100%, they tend to draw more energy. So there's a lot of negatives associated with reactive, and I don't think many people misunderstand that. Uh, especially based on survey results, because we did see a, a good bunch of people that have really tried to do something about it by moving to a more preventive type program. And so a preventive type program is really, you want to take you know, the surprise factor out of things. Um, the theory is, if I perform some general maintenance during a time where I'm not inter interrupting my production line, um, I shouldn't really have any unplanned downtime events. I'll keep it up and keep my machine up and running in good shape. I'll never have a breakdown during production. So that is you know, certainly the goal. So less downtime is an advantage to doing that. Fewer interruptions to production uh, because you should be doing the maintenance when it's not in impacting uh, production. You should be extending the asset life, um, again, because if you're keeping it running smoothly, less wear and tear. Talked about safety a little bit. Should be improved safety when you're not under the gun trying to get that you know machine up and running as quickly as possible. Um, you're going to take the time to do it right and be safe about doing it. So all those are the you know the, the positives, and I think a lot of people understand um, why that is, and that's why many places have always put in, have already put in some sort of um, preventive plan. But there are some downsides to that. One of the, the 
the biggest downsides has to do with the whole uh, schedule-based type of maintenance, where you've developed a maintenance schedule based on historical values. So typically, you'll you'll get some sort of manufacturer's re recommendation on when certain parts should be replaced or repaired or adjusted. Um, you'll maybe marry that with some information you have from your own uh, experience with the device, and uh, and perhaps even use uh, third-party guidelines such as NFPA 70B um, to, to determine when I should be doing maintenance cycles. And when you think about that, all of that is based on an average. So what happens if my machine is not running at the average cycle? Uh, two things can happen. One, um, my machine may actually be experiencing more uh, stress than expected, and it winds up breaking down before you perform the preventive maintenance on it. So now you're into one of those unplanned events. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you could be doing maintenance when you really don't need to. Um, and you know, if that only happens once, you say not a, not a big deal, but over the life of the equipment, if you're performing twice as many maintenance cycles as you need to, there's a cost associated with it. Um, just because the machine didn't break down doesn't mean there's no cost associated with maintenance. You still have labor involved with doing the adjustments. You have you know, inspections to see how the equipment's performing. You've got you know, whatever parts and, and labor you're, you're including um, during that maintenance event. So you know, that, that still gives you, puts you in a position where you can't eliminate all uh, unplanned events, and you could be actually spending more maintenance than you need to. There's also some upfront investment in implementing such a plan. Um, there's usually some sort of software, some CMMS or something like that to manage the process um, to make sure you're keeping on schedule and, and monitoring uh, that the maintenance is actually getting done. So there's some, some costs associated with that. Um, you'll typically want to have a, a you know, a, maintenance staff that can support that plan, so maybe you'll have more staff than you would have if you had just a reactive plan. Um, but all of the uh, advantages this type of program uh, sort of outweigh the negatives. But there's still going to be a desire to want to make this more efficient, and the problem is you can't really do that unless you know exactly how your equipment is operating. You know, instead of going on some theoretical uh, lifespan of a, of a component, you really need to know how is it actually performing and where it is in this uh, maintenance cycle. And that's where people are start starting to move into uh, predictive maintenance types of programs. And these types of programs can only work when you know what the actual operating condition is of your equipment. So um, how do you know that? The only way to know that is to have some sort of sensing equipment on the device that tells you exactly what's going on. Okay, so you typically need a more sophisticated piece of equipment. But the advantage to that is that if I know exactly what's going on with my equipment, I can better plan for my maintenance. Um, so I can prevent unplanned events, but I also can prevent over-maintenance because I'm going to be performing uh, maintenance based on actual health of the machine as opposed to some predetermined schedule that's based on an average. And so condition-based monitoring is at the core of this predictive thing. Now, some, some people break out condition-based monitoring as a separate maintenance plan. Um, I kind of lumped it in with uh, predictive because you can't do anything predictive without actually measuring the condition uh, of, the, of, the, of the device. So first, you've got to be able to monitor the actual condition and deal with it you know, when, the, when the condition monitoring equipment tells you you have to. But then all the data you're collecting is used to, make, to have predictive insights as to when do I really think I'm going to need to do this so I can actually plan for it a little bit better. And that's where the whole predictive nature of this program comes in. So clearly, you, know, you can see where the benefits are on, on this program, type of program. Um, not only are you going to have fewer uh, maintenance events, um, but you should have better uptime. Uh, you should actually be improving quality because one of the things that happens, even in a preventive plan, is you know a machine may not break down, but it starts to produce more bad parts. So you wind up with more scrap during a production process. 
um, because it's going out of tolerance and, well, it's not due for maintenance yet, so I'm not going to stop it. I don't want to stop my production line. Um, so if you're actually measuring the performance of the machine, as soon as it starts to become an issue, it's not broken down, um, but I know that it's starting to not produce parts, uh, quality parts the way I want to, I can actually schedule some maintenance uh, to keep the quality up. So there's improvements in quality with this type of, type of program. Obviously, and, uh, you know, you talk about asset life, certainly maximizing asset life because you're doing the preventive maintenance when it needs to happen. You're reducing the overspending you might see with a uh, preventive type plan. On the downside of that, there is some investments in technology. Um, obviously, you need sensors. You know, so if, uh, if, you, if you don't have sensors, you need to get sensors. If you have equipment that doesn't have that capability, you might have to get new equipment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Um, there's certainly an investment in infrastructure. And when, when it comes to actually collecting all the data that you're now pulling out of these sensors and then making sense out of that uh, information. Because you, you, know, you can tell, you get a wealth of information, but unless you have some way of distilling it down into actionable insights, all you're doing is storing data. So there's some investment in that, which means you also need to improve the skill set of, of the maintenance staff. Uh, people are going to need to be able to, to manage these types of programs and follow the uh, predictive insights that are given. So it's a little bit more investment in, in time and training and things like that. But clearly, it, it, it does optimize your maintenance schedule. So if we just review the last three uh, types, we talked about reactive, preventive, and predictive. Just to summarize, there's pros and cons to everything. On the reactive side, the pros is it's the easiest to implement. Um, doesn't require any planning, but obviously, on uh, the con side of things, it's the most expensive and disruptive. Um, as we move into preventive, it really reduces the number of unplanned downtime events. Um, relatively uh, simple to implement, but it does require some investment in, in technology and training. Um, but the biggest problem with preventive is the fact that it's not condition-based. So um, it's going to be better than reactive, but you're still going to wind up with uh, issues where you're running into unplanned events and then you may be spending more on maintenance than you really need to. And so the predictive seeks to patch up those holes in, in the preventive side by actually doing maintenance only when it really needs to be done. And just for completeness, I'll, I'll spend just a, a minute or two talking about prescriptive maintenance. Um, you've probably heard a lot more discussion around this in the last year or two. And it's largely because of the technology out there that's helping foster this type of uh, plan. But essentially, prescriptive maintenance is very similar to predictive, except that it's really taking advantage of some of the advancements in AI technology and uh, machine learning, and not only predicting when uh, maintenance is required, but exactly what maintenance task needs to be required. So with this type of program, it'll tell you, okay, machine A needs to have uh, a service done on this date and time, and it's go you're going to do this exact procedure, and it'll tell you what parts you need and, and, and what you should have in stock and what types of skills you'll need of the employee doing it. Um, takes it to that next level. Um, again, technology is really uh, making this all possible. Um, and certainly when you talk about the IIoT and connected sensors and connected equipment, um, you're seeing this uh, vision realized. So now, how do we take that information uh, and, and use it to say, uh, you know, how do I decide what plan is best for me? And now we're ready for our second survey question. What we'd like to know is, what's really the primary goal for your organization in implementing a more effective maintenance program? So what are you trying to accomplish in, in, in when you're improving your, your maintenance program? Is it fewer maintenance tasks? Sorry, a little technical difficulty here. Is it fewer maintenance tasks overall you're just trying to uh, reduce? 
Um, are you trying to get to near zero on planned downtime? Uh, you see that's becoming a buzzword in the industry now. People are going to zero downtime. Um, I'm not sure if that's ever achievable when humans are involved, but, <laughs> but um, near zero da on, on planned downtime is a goal. Are you just trying to improve your productivity? So I need, a, you know, through maintenance, uh, I, I need to improve the productivity. I'm not so much concerned with the cost of maintenance, but I need I need to improve my uptime. Uh, am I trying to just minimize my maintenance costs or improve the equipment life cycle? Do I want to just keep my machines longer than, than they're lasting? So we're getting some pretty good results here. It looks like a lot of people are just looking to improve productivity or get to near zero on planned downtime events. And that's not really surprising at all. That, those are two big key drivers for predictive maintenance programs. Got some people uh, still clocking in. Have a good amount of users just looking to improve maintenance overall. So interesting, most the least amount of people are worried about the actual actually minimizing maintenance costs. It's, it's, and that's actually it's actually a good thing because you're looking at the bigger picture. Because minimizing maintenance costs doesn't necessarily make the most business sense. You know, it's actually you know keeping you as productive as possible. So that's good. All right. So as you can see there, about uh, it's the biggest group, 36% of the people, said their, their goal is near zero unplanned downtime. It's the winner. All right, so now we want to get to you know, which plan makes the most sense for me. And uh, clearly there's no one answer that's used across all industries. Um, and you've probably been getting that based on the conversation we've been having thus far. Um, a lot of it's going to depend on um, what type of processes you have going on on your facility. Um, and quite frankly, you're probably going to have a mix of things. Um, while it sounds like preventive sounds great or predict, even predictive, um, when you think about the implementation costs, I'm not sure that we would necessarily want to employ a preventive or predictive approach. Uh, I, I mean, I should say a yeah, pre preventive, predictive, or prescriptive approach to monitoring my light bulbs in the office area. You know, that's something where you know, reactive probably works fine. It doesn't. It's not going to save me anything um, by investing in software to, to predict when my light bulb is going to go out. Um, that being said, you still could be a little bit strategic about how you employ that. You, you can have the light bulbs stored in, in close proximity where they need to be replaced, as opposed to maybe off-site or you know at the offset in the building of where you're going to be replacing those bulbs. So um, you know, clearly, there's a place for it. Um, but here's where we talk about: you really have to analyze your facility, look at everything, um, not only the entire facility but each individual component to see what makes the most sense. So you're going to look at all your assets and say, you know, what is it costing me today? Um, where do I need to get to? And what approach is, going to, is really going to help me? And for example, I would say your most critical assets is probably where investment makes sense. And so you start looking at those assets first and say, OK, here's where I really want to make some improvements. Um, they are my most critical, and I can start here. And I can take a look at you know, what skill sets do I have today? What technology do I have today to, to implement such a thing? What, what do my, my investments need to be? Uh, what budgets do I have to, to work with? Um, all that's going to play into you know, what makes the most sense for your organization. And then what you do is you, you make those assessments. And as I said, you could have different uh, approaches to different parts of the facility, depending on what it is you're trying to improve. So let's talk a little bit about some of the technology solutions. And this is going to be a fairly high-level discussion on um, what's available to help you implement such things. So clearly, if you're in the market for new machinery, uh, and if anybody's been out there looking at, at machines and equipment these days, 
you'll find that they're already embedded with all the sensors you could possibly need to, ma to monitor every piece of that equipment and the performance of it. So, uh, and then you can, you know, fairly sim simply connect it into your existing system that manages all your devices and it, it's not really all that difficult. Um, the thing is not everybody's in the market to replace all the machinery uh, in, in their facility, at least not all at once. Well, it'd be great to do that. I don't think we have the budgets to do such a thing. So what can you do in the absence of just swapping out all your existing equipment? Well, there's a whole uh, plethora of, of solutions, of add-on solutions, for just about any type of equipment that might be in your shop. First of all, a lot of the equipment you have today um, that's you know, got PLCs driving it is automatically generating data that you're probably not using. So just connecting, getting software and connectivity devices that start extracting that data and making sense out of it can start giving you predictive results immediately. There's also a lot of add-on sensors that you can do, especially for motors. Um, you know, that's the most common area where people are looking to employ these types of predictive or prescriptive uh, maintenance plans. Um, you can get all kinds of add-on vibration and temperature sensors that can simply uh, be attached to the motor, connected to the internet, brought into your systems, and then have that data analyzed along with the rest of your data. So you could have brand new smart machines next to legacy machines with these add-on sensors and get the same results that you're looking for. Um, so that you know, in terms of software, uh, one of the things that's really made um, this type of software more accessible to, to the masses is the advancements in cloud technology and cloud computing. You know, not only from a storage area, from a pure processing uh, standpoint, you don't have to build a data center on site necessarily unless you want to, um, but uh, there's plenty of cloud resources that allow you to relatively inexpensively uh, get set up and start feeding data into these platforms and making, giving you insights pretty quickly. Another thing I should mention about uh, pre preventive, predict well, I should say predictive and prescriptive plans, you know, out of the box, you're not going to get predictive insights. One of the things you have to realize is the predictive part comes out of the historical performance of, of your devices. So you're measuring actual performance. You're making decisions when the conditions show that I need to ma make a certain uh, decision on maintenance, but then ultimately you want to keep looking at that data and say, okay, um, I don't want to just know about it when it's time to do the uh, maintenance. I want some sort of um, heads up well in advance so that I can better plan for these maintenance events. And that's where the predictive part comes in. Um, so you have to start, you, know, you have to invest in some infrastructure, you have to start collecting data. Um, you'll immediately get some benefit on the condition monitoring portion, but the predictive part is going to take some time to build up. And there's one other thing I'd like to mention. You know, we, we speak a lot about the actual assets and uh, electrical equipment um, that's running in our shops and worrying about that. Um, but one piece that you can't ignore in your factory is, you know, especially if you're running electrical equipment, is your electrical distribution center needs the same kind of attention. Because it really doesn't matter how good a machine you have and how well it's uh, monitoring performance. If it's connected to uh, dirty power, that's going to have a significant impact on your machinery. So you really need to put in devices that can help you monitor the overall health and condition of your electrical distribution system around the facility as well. So there are devices that can do that, where you know, whether they're embedded in, in some of your branch circuit disconnects, or, um, or just separate power quality meters and things like that, um, you can get the same types of insights into how your electrical distribution system is performing. Because um, again, at the end of the day, that's going to have a significant impact on how your equipment performs as well. Here we go. Sorry for the delay. All right. So I just want to have a, a final uh, closing thought on, on all of this. Um, I guess any presentation about this type of subject 
this day would not be complete without some talk of, of the new world order we're in. And I'm not necessarily talking about the, the political side of things. I'm talking about you know the impact of uh, things like COVID has shown us what happens uh, when our business continuity plans are in jeopardy. So one of the things you should be looking at with any of your uh, uh, implementations is how do I uh, include some way of monitoring uh, my facility remotely? Um, whether it's just because uh, there's some sort of event um, that's preventing me from getting into my office, um, and you know we're talking about COVID these days, and you know this hopefully will be. You know, in the next year or so, that'll be under control, and maybe we won't see something like it for another 100 years. Um, but we all know over the last few years, when we look at weather events that are just as disruptive, maybe not for as long a period of time, um, but uh, nonetheless, they do disrupt our business. So having the capability of, of working remotely is going to be extremely important. But uh, you know, specifically to what we're seeing with things like COVID, and maybe there's going to be a, you know, another version of this, where we just need to limit the number of people in a, in a confined space at any given moment. Um, we can actually use this remote monitoring to actually deploy resources uh, properly and make sure that you know, not everybody has to be on site if, they're, if they aren't needed, but because I can monitor things remotely, if I know a maintenance task is gonna be required on a specific day, I can schedule my workers to go in on those days, not just be there you know, every day waiting, to happen, waiting for things to happen. Um, so you know, in, in any solution that you're implementing, don't lose sight of the fact that having uh, the ability to, to monitor or even control things remotely should be a part of your solution. All right, so that's uh, all we have time for uh, today. Um, before um, we get to the Q&A session, uh, we just have one more uh, message from from us, your, your sponsor, and uh, we'll come back right after that. I'd like to take the time to thank everyone again for joining us today. I hope you got some uh, informative information out of this event. And um, if you have any questions, we're here for a few more minutes to be able to answer some questions. Kevin? Well, thanks, John, for your insightful presentation. Uh, for our audience, John is now available to answer questions. Type your questions in the Ask a Question box. We'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that we don't get today, we post it online with the archived version of the webcast. To download a certificate of completion, a copy of the presentation, and other resources, use the event resources tab on the left side of the screen. Uh, John, we only have a few minutes of time to actually answer questions, unfortunately, but it was an interesting presentation, and, and I, I thought it was very clear, but one of our listeners wanted to be a little bit more clear about the difference between prescriptive and condition-based maintenance. And I, I think the answer is that condition-based monitoring is the means by which prescriptive or predictive is attained. Uh, but maybe you can, you can uh, give a little more clarity there. Yeah, yes, Kevin, that's exactly uh, the difference. You, you summarized it nicely. Um, as I mentioned, those two programs 
rely on you understanding what the actual condition of a piece of equipment is um, because it's going to make your predictive insights based on actual uh, running conditions. Um, but there is a, you know, a point in time where it's going to say this part is you know, at the end of its life, it needs to be replaced now uh, before my machine goes down. Um, that's the condition monitoring part of it, and that's where some people say, okay, that's, that's as far as I'm taking it. I just want a, a little bit of a heads up um, of when something needs to be replaced, then I'll respond accordingly. Um, again, it differs from the, the schedule base because it's not based on some fixed time period. It's based on actually monitoring uh, the device. So think about, um, I'll use the example of, of oil changes in a car, and it's, it's a little bit of a, um, an offbeat example because it's not true condition monitoring, but it used to be the car manual said you have to change your oil every certain number of thousands of miles. Uh, for us old yep. school people, it used to be 3,000 miles, and now it's closer to 7,500 miles. Um, but in fact, newer cars now, uh, they don't necessarily give you uh, that kind of guideline. For example, I drive a Honda now, and uh, there's no specific recommendation on number of miles. What's actually happening is the computers are taking a look at those you know, standard uh, intervals, but then it's also looking at things like the average engine operating temperature and the average speed you drive, and factoring those things into it to say, well, if, if these are abnormal, either high or low, I'm going to adjust when that uh, oil should be changed. And so, you know, my, my car, um, if I take it to the dealer, they will not change the oil unless the car says it needs to be changed, right? So they're saying, you know, it's, uh, I'm measuring the, it's not, it's not truly measuring the condition of the oil. There's no viscosity tester on there. Um, so in a true condition-based monitoring, you'd actually be measuring a real metric. But they're trying to simulate that by factoring all the other things that have impact the life uh, expectancy of that oil to give you a more accurate predictor of when you need to change it. And so that's, that's sort of one thing. That's the condition-based part of it. But then if you want to have a better insight for planning down the road, you want to know, well, if, okay, it told me once that I need to change it at this interval, but over the course of a year that varied. Um, I need for the following year, I need to understand better for planning um, when am I going to do, uh, have to do those things. The other thing it will ha do is it'll kind of compare events. Well, when one part starts to fail, it impacts the useful life of another part. And so the software will start looking at all those um, kinds of um, connections and coming up with more predictive insights to all the components, um, which is something really difficult to do without software to start relating all of the repair events to make more sense out of things. I, ho I hope that makes a little bit more sense. Of course it did. Thank you so much. Uh, a more specific question. Will, will Leviton be offering disconnects with informed technology? Um, yes, at some point we will. Uh, and I thought you mentioned already that, that Leviton was developing something specifically for electrical distribution monitoring, but we have a question from that for our readers, so I thought I'd give you a chance to, to clarify if it's needed. Sure. Yeah, so, so essentially, um, uh, if you look at the products we have out there now, um, we have some technology that is actually monitoring the, the voltage that passes through a, a, a disconnect switch. It's actually a mechanical interlock, and, uh, but essentially a disconnect switch with a receptacle in it. And it's, not, it's telling you the actual condition of each phase of the electricity passing through it. So it will not only tell you whether it's present or not present, It'll give you actually voltage values, um, tell you when they're not normal, um, when there's imbalances, and some rudimentary uh, power quality type uh, information. And again, those are, that type of information, when you talk about predictive uh, insights, those types of things aren't um, single events that cause a problem and need immediate action. It's the cumul accumulation of a number of events over a period of time that start to give you some insights as to what to do. So what, what happens is you start looking at all these minor disturbances that don't necessarily shut down my machine, but will reduce the effective life of that. Um, and so that, that's the type of technology we're putting into our products. Good. Uh, getting a whole raft of questions from our readers here. I'm struggling a little bit to digest them. But I think one of the issues is retrofitting legacy production lines. And one question here, our production lines being provided with wireless internet for wireless sensors. 
Talk a little bit about, John, if you will, the introduction of new kinds of sensors and how those are being incorporated into legacy installations, brownfield installations, to begin achieving the kind of vibration analysis and oil analysis that are being introduced into, you know, as you say, real-time uh, uh, predictive processes or maintenance processes. Right. Yeah. So, so this um, there's a number of manufacturers that that make sen add-on sensors uh, for pieces of equipment. And again, specifically motors. We mentioned um, vibration sensors and things that actually uh, with motors it's actually fairly simple. You just have a, a magnetic uh, base that uh, attaches to the motor, and it can pick up all the, the vibrations and build a signature out of that, and compare it to the expected signature. Um, where the, where things get a little bit tricky is more in, in the wireless technology uh, that's being u utilized. In some cases, it's uh, pure Wi-Fi, individually connecting uh, to the cloud. In other cases, it might be using some other wireless uh, protocol that speaks to a hub and then ultimately communicates out to wherever it needs to go. Um, but it, it's, it's key to be wireless because you, you know, there's a limit to how many wires you can be running everywhere. Um, so there, is a, there are a number of different technologies uh, that are effective, uh, being effectively used, um, but you also have to look at what's what's in your facility and what's easiest to connect today. So um, you know, I, I don't know if I, if I answered all that correctly, but I believe you did. It was a, a kind of a meandering question to start out with, but let's back, take a step back, and look at a larger management question. What mm -hmm. do you find are the largest hurdles for maintenance? executives and engineers who are interested in moving to predictive maintenance, what, what are the biggest challenges or hurdles they're going to find? Yeah, so, so that goes back to really uh, some of the beginning conversation we had on this topic. Um, clearly, uh, for executive buy-in, they're always going to ask about ROI, which is, is sometimes hard to calculate exactly. But quite honestly, where, where things fall short is when people aren't really looking at the true costs of, of their downtime events, um, when they're not factoring in all the things that happen, um, it's sometimes hard to justify the investments because, uh, you know, sometimes for a pre predictive or prescriptive plan, it could be a sizable investment. And if you're, you're miscalculating your, 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 uh, your costs by 50%, you 80%, know, you'll say, oh, there's no way I can justify that that expense. So really having a, a, a good handle on what's really costing you. And, and don't just stick to the direct economic impacts. Talk about the business impacts. Because of that, I'm now not able to produce and, and respond to spike orders uh, that would give us a competitive advantage, uh, for example, because we can respond to those orders quickly. Um, if I lose that capability, um, put a number on that. That's, uh, executives are more, uh, going to be more interested in and what it means to the, the business than to the fact that I'm going to save you know, a certain percentage on my maintenance costs. It's more about how am I improving my business. We're going to have better safety. Um, we're going to you know, reduce our uh, disruptions, which will allow us to produce X amount more. Um, it will give us more flexibility to respond and, and reconfigure to meet customer demands. Those types of things are most important to get buy-in. And you can Great, thank you. Um, only time for one more question, and I'm, I think, and that is, are staff changes likely to follow in wake of the transition from reactive to predictive maintenance? Well, staff changes, it's usually not, um, staff changes in the, are probably going to be, yeah, you're going to need to add more staff and, and, and upskill existing staff. I don't know if, uh, you know, some people get worried that, oh, that means machines are replacing my function. That's not really the, the goal of, of a predictive or prescriptive plan. Um, basically, you're improving the performance of your maintenance team. Um, it might re it's going to require more technical skill set. So, yeah, you may be able to retrain, or you may need to bring on new talent that has more capabilities. Uh, that, that's the type of thing you'll need. But you'll definitely need to, to, you know, to add some kind of capabilities that you may not have today. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. And I want to thank our audience for their good questions. Um, uh, now that we're ending 
I'd like to also, excuse me, I'd also like to expend special thanks to our sponsor, Levitin Manufacturing, for their support of today's event. Uh, now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering and Levitin Manufacturing, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast, and we'll see you next time.